Good afternoon and thank you very much for uh, joining uh, the next instalment in the uh, Kirby seminar series, which today will be on global health research at the Kirby Institute, a brief history and future prospects, which will be presented by Cientia Professor uh, John Caldor. Before we start, I'd like to acknowledge uh, the uh, traditional owners of the land from which we all take uh, this uh, seminar. I myself are on, am on Dawal uh, land, uh, and I acknowledge uh, the tradi those traditional custodians of the land uh, uh, on which we gather and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. And I extend that respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders who join us today. So the format of the seminar uh, today, will uh, John will uh, make uh, the presentation, uh, and then we'll have a uh, brief panel dis discussion, uh, and there will be a chance uh, at the end for audience uh, uh, questions to be answered. And to uh, raise those questions, please enter those questions using the Q and A box uh, at the uh, bottom of your screen by clicking on that and typing your questions in. So today's lecture will be presented by John Caldor, who, as I send, said, is a Scientia professor and also NHMRC senior principal research fellow here at the Kirby. He's been at the Kirby for over 35 years and during that time has led internationally recognized research programs on epidemiology and prevention of infectious diseases with a particular focus on HIV, other blood-brawn and sexual transmitted miscible infections, and increasingly uh, in the last couple of years on neglected tropical diseases. So with no further ado, I'll hand over to John. Thank you, John. I seem to have control. Okay. <laughs> Is that okay now? Yeah, that's fine. So you can just start from the beginning now. All right, thanks very much. And uh, thanks, Tony, for the introduction. Uh, it's not quite 35 years. I'm some, I think I'm a bit over the 30 year mark here, but 35 years is still a little way off. Um, I'd like to acknowledge the uh, traditional owners where I am in Northern New South Wales, the Araquel people up here at what's known as Cabin Bar. And um, I'd also like to acknowledge many, many colleagues from many countries in our region, particularly um, with whom I've had the privilege of working with in in the topics that are the subject of today's presentation. Um, today's presentation is very much um, a personal reflection. I'm not aiming to provide a comprehensive overview of global health at the Kirby Institute or anywhere else. Um, when I first had took on the idea of doing this presentation, I, I was slightly panicked by the idea of trying to do a comprehensive overview. Um, uh, but then I realized that probably wasn't either feasible or, or, or a useful thing to try to do. Um, my focus is going to be on the origins, our partnerships and the processes of global health. Um, so I'm not going to be trying to describe methods of the research or the outcomes of the research in any detail whatsoever. Um, and so if anybody who's expecting a, a standard research talk, um, probably a good time to go and think about something, doing something else, because that's not what this talk's going to be. Um, I will try and provide my personal insights into what's gone well in our efforts in global health. Um, but I certainly won't be providing a critical analysis and, and there'll be many things that, um, uh, that could be said that I, I won't be trying to say. Um, and I very much view this as a first look at our global health efforts um, in, a, in, a, in a global sense. And I hope it's the start of many more such discussions uh, within and beyond the Kirby Institute. Um, Global health stems from the notion of inequity in health. And, and I've, in this next slide, um, again, very, very much a selected history of, of the understanding of global inequity and how it's evolved to the present day. Um, if we go back to the 19th century, um, it really was not uh, an agenda particularly, but organizations such as the International Committee of the Red Cross were founded in, in the mid 19th century. Uh, the, the international uh, meetings of what, what's called the International Sanitary Committees tried to figure out ways that countries could work together to control infectious diseases, and particularly through mechanisms such as quarantine. 
And then the Pan American Health Organization was started just around 1900 uh, with the goal of trying to control infectious diseases um, in, in the Americas. And they, these organizations, th these initiatives were not really about reducing health inequity, but they, because that, I guess that wasn't really an idea, but it was certainly like the, the plan of these organizations to work collaboratively across countries, and which was really the forerunner of, of the global health movement. The World Health Organization, to bring us into the more modern era, was founded in 1948, following the, the reconstruction after the Second World War. Um, and a number of very important developments happened uh, subsequent to that. But I think a, re a really important initiative was the, the USAID, which was the, the US um, International Development Agency, was founded in 1961 under the Kennedy administration and, and really sing singled out health as a key part of its agenda. Um, the 1970s, I think, was when there was a real explosion in global health organizations. And a number of the key organizations that we see today, um, this is quite a diverse list, were founded in the 1970s, like Medicine Sans Frontier, the, the French organization, which now has a budget of uh, several billion dollars a year, uh, FHI 360 and PSI. These are two organizations that started off in reproductive health and expanded into many, many countries and with very substantial funding through USAID. And then uh, uh, PATH is another organization started in the 70s with a focus on, on trying to improve technologies for uh, countries of low and middle income countries. Um, in, in, this, in terms of the culture of global health, a key um, development was the World Health Organization's meeting in 1978 in, in Kazakhstan with, uh, around the, the idea of, of uh, health for all and particularly the idea of health as a human right. The, the Alma Ata Declaration, which emerged from that, really established the notion that there was no reason why people should have different differential levels of health according to where, they're, where they happen to live or which, what their other circumstances were. Um, of course, that is far from being fulfilled, as I'll, I'll refer to in a second, but it was very much the start of, of the, the notion of health as a human right. Um, and the 1980s, we saw a number of different agendas. In 1978, of course, uh, um, smallpox had been eradicated from the world. And so the 1980s saw this, the start of, of trying to broaden the idea of eliminating other diseases, uh, but also a number of other de important developments for global health, the WHO essential drugs list for across all, that all countries should have access to, the democratic demographic health survey idea that, that, that we should have much better data on, on um, what's happening on, in health status in, in low and middle income countries. Uh, and really sort of set the groundwork for a better understanding of how to respond. Um, the 1990s, um, and of course, you know, this is a very ab much an abbreviated summary and, and I've missed many, many important developments, but I think it's fair to say that the 1980, 1990s, global health was driven by HIV activism and the link between activism, research and the necessary funding. And, and this is, I think HIV was probably the first um, global disease where there was a recognition that whatever happened on a, on a, uh, in terms of response had to be available to people in all countries at all levels of income. And, 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 and it was, that, was, that was quite a, a revolutionary notion at that time, uh, but it became a reality uh, in the 2000s when organizations such as the Global Fund uh, for AIDS, TB and malaria, um, and then uh, the, the, under the first, the, sorry, the second Bush administration, the PEPFAR, uh, the, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation was established and started becoming a huge engine for funding research in low and middle income countries. Gavi was funded, was founded for providing vaccines. Uh, and the Institute of uh, Health Measurement and Evaluation was, was, which followed on from the global burden of diseases was founded and started to regenerate global data on, on uh, health. You, you notice that as an epidemiologist, I, I'm very keen to single out things like the DHS and the IHME uh, this is this is acronym soup, but these are all very important um, agendas as the global health uh, picture emerged. Um, in the background of all this, or in, and probably more and more in the foreground, was the first the Millennium Development Goals in the two, in 2000 and the 2015 the Sustainable Develop, Development Goals with a strong health focus. So this, all these all these uh, milestones, uh, organisations, and and uh, different achievements really pointed to the idea that health inequity was not something that we, we could tolerate and we had to always move to try to reduce it. Um, now, health inequity, why is health inequity a bad thing? Well, this is, 
uh, the, an American demographer, uh, Preston, in 1975, was the, was the first person to plot this, this graph, which shows GDP per capita against life expectancy. And there's, there's two things about this curve that are really striking. This, this is a 2006 version. You can get many different versions off the internet of this curve. Um, this, this one has got lots of countries. Each dot represents a country. And um, there's two things that I think are striking about this curve. First of all, is the radical shift upwards as you, even with small increments in income, the increase in life expectancy is, is very substantial. So going from 45 to 70, just over a, a very small increment. So, so it doesn't take much to improve health in terms of, of inputs, but many, many countries are still stuck down here in the low income range. The second point is that at a certain, there is this plateauing. And I think this is something that's very important that the more resources you sink into health and the United States is always pointed out as being way out here with not with a, by far the biggest uh, per capita income. Uh, this is when you plot it in, in, uh, in, in relation to health, health expenditures um, and, and, but not necessarily the best outcomes. This, this, this is per capita uh, income overall, but the graph looks very similar to when you, when you plot it with uh, health related income. Uh, so this is a, a key point that, that countries need to have um, a, a basic level of input to achieve health outcomes. And things have improved and you can, again, you can get many graphs like this off the internet. This is a, a key indicator of how well a country is doing in its health system. A very important one is child mortality, which is the, the percent of children who survive, who, who, who survive or who don't survive beyond five years. Uh, and in Australia, that, that, that it's uh, the, the uh, child mortality under five is around three per thousand, so 0.3%. So we're down here somewhere. But many countries, and particularly African countries, and also some uh, South, some countries of our region are still up here. The, the, these, these lines show the, the, tr the transition between 1995 and 2014. So well, it, it's good to see that many countries are on a downward trajectory, but many countries are still stuck up here. And you can see that the countries that are obviously the highest levels of child mortality are the countries with the lowest incomes. And, and these are health expenditure per capita, which is, as you can see, around about 100 times lower, one, 100 times lower than what we have in Australia. So 50 compared to 5,000. So there are phenomenal differences in expenditure. But of course, it's not all about expenditure. The, the idea of global health is not just about funding. It's about an, a much broader approach to trying to make sure that there, the inequity is reduced or eliminated. So there's been many definitions of global health. Uh, this is one that's often cited uh, from a paper in the, in the Lancet by Coplin and colleagues, the study research and practice that places a priority on improving health and achieving equity in health in people, in health for all people worldwide. But that's a, 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 a definition that's been debated the principles underlying it have been debated, and I'll come back to some of those points later on in this presentation. Um, I think it's fair to say, though, it's, this, this, the whole concept of global health has been largely driven by academic organisations. You can see in this definition, study, research, these are terms that are applying to academic organisations. So, so it's very much a, 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 an organisational, um, an academic driven phenomenon. And also it's been driven by academic organisations in the global north, and that's the, the term that's used to describe the, the, the rich countries, most of which are in the northern hemisphere, but also includes Australia and, and New Zealand and, and some other countries in the in the southern hemisphere. So global health is something that we need to practice, we need to be involved in, but we also need to recognize um, some of the issues that arise in our leadership, our so-called leadership of the global health agenda. And again, I'll come back to some of those points. Um, there's no question that the, globe, the Kirby Institute is a global health research institute. We have 25 year history of activity in this area. Um, global health is something that was very close to the heart of our founding director, David Cooper, cl our close friend and colleague. Um, and, and David would always refer to us as a global health research institute uh, in, in name as well as in practice. Uh, sorry, in practice, if not in name. Um, why are we a global health research institute? Well, we've had funding from major international donors to do work in low and middle income countries. We've had collaborations in many low and middle income countries and partnerships with government, academic and community organizations. We've undertaken training and capacity re building relationships in, in many places. We have had policy engagement with individual countries and with the World Health Organization. 
Uh, and I think very importantly, we have many staff from low and middle income countries or who have worked in low and middle income countries. And that's a, a resource, a very strong resource that we have at the Kirby Institute. So there's no doubt that we fit the bill. Um, so my objective here is really to try to think about our history and draw some lessons from our history. There's many ways that we could review our history. There's, it's a long and complex history. Could it be by time period, by country, by disease, by who did the research, by who funded it? Um, and there's, there's no simple tidy way. So, so I, I, in the end, I just thought, well, let's take a sort of a selected case history approach and try and, and, try and do it that way. So I'm gonna be stepping through a few projects, a few areas, um, and I focused on areas that have been major initiatives with funding that was led by us, taking place over an extended time, had a focus in the countries that are classified in lower and middle income countries. Um, so you'll see that there's, there's six topics I've listed and I'll just cover each of them in a, in a, in a minute or two each. Uh, HIVNAD in Thailand, our collaborations in Cambodia, our work in Papua New Guinea, uh, through the internet, the uh, Institute of Medical Research, and uh, hopefully, uh, oh, Willie, I can see Willie's Willie's joined us now, the director of the uh, current director of the PNGIMR, who's also affiliated as a conjoint professor with the Kirby Institute. So it's great to have Willie um, join us. I wasn't sure he, he was going to be able to. Uh, our work in Indonesia, and then our, our international trial networks. So starting off with HIVNAT. Um, so HIVNAT is, I think, the I have to say, have to, would have to say is probably our greatest success story in, in, in our global health initiatives. Um, it, it was a three-way partnership between the Thai Red Cross, the Kirby Institute and the Amsterdam Institute for Global Health, um, founded jointly by the three directors of these, uh, organ the Thai Red Cross AIDS Research Centre was directed by Prapan Panyapak, who uh, has received an honorary doctorate recently from the University of New South Wales, uh, the late Yip Langer, who was the director of the Amsterdam Institute, and of course, our director, David Cooper, jointly funded jointly founded HIVNAT. Um, they initially got support for HIVNAT through their very close relationships with, with pharmaceutical industry, uh, but then they were very soon able to bring in funding from the United States National Institutes of Health and other major funders. Um, a, a key point for HIVNAT was that from the very beginning and going on for uh, at least uh, 15 years after that, there was always one or two Kirby Institute staff based in country. Uh, and and several of it, and uh, and and they they stayed several years each and and ended up uh, making major contributions and by being actually able to work directly with with uh, the the collaborators in in Thailand. Um, another key aspect that we that was part of the Hivnat story was that from the very beginning was understanding that that countries not not just uh, collaboration and in clinical trials was, was the focus, but also uh, a strong support for the laboratory development that underpinned the clinical trials. Uh, and so uh, this was always a component of, of HIVNAT and ended up being a, a key part of, again, part of the success. Uh, you know, Philip, Cunning, Philip Cunningham, who's uh, again, a, a conjoint with the Kirby Institute, but based at St. Vincent's, uh, was, was really in, in a sort of a, a shuttle role as a key mentor for this development. And, a role he went on to 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 uh, um, replicate in in Cambodia and then in the in the March uh, program in 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 Myanmar and, and several other countries. Um, the outcome for HIVNAT after 25 years after its foundation is that it's now a, a truly a, a regional hub for both laboratory and clinical research and training, uh, and it's seen as an independent regional leader in in HIV and STI research. Uh, and this has been through a number of factors that I think have, have driven the success. Um, first of all, when it was founded, it had a very strong institutional base already. The Thai Red Cross AIDS Research Centre had been founded in about seven years ago, previously in 1989. Uh, but I think equally important was a very strong bond among the three co-leads, uh, Yup, David and Prapan. And that, and that, that basis of trust enabled them to take things forward in a very uh, comprehensive manner. All, all three of them, but I think particularly uh, David and Yup's global connections in HIV policy and, and research meant that that things could happen very fast and, and relationships could those relationships could um, translate into both funding and and uh, 
uh, collect re research protocols quite quickly and, and, and the, the range of different projects that ended up being conducted through uh, HIVNET, I think is a, is a reflection of those connections. Uh, a couple of other factors, Thailand was already at quite advanced stage of development and had a, a strong uh, research and, and university base. And so there, was, there were a number of people who were already in a very receptive status for uh, the, the clinical and laboratory inputs that came through, through HIVNET. So it was very good timing. Also very good timing in terms of the, 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 um, the attention to the global HIV pandemic had shifted towards Asia at that point and, and Thailand was very well placed to be the base for that to happen. So now moving on to Cambodia. Um, I, I first went to Cambodia and I think Greg Dorr went along there with, and, and on, with WHO uh, sort of consultancy hat on. And we, we, we met the people from NCHADS who were uh, the National Center for HIV, um, uh, HIV AIDS Dermatology and STIs, which was the government agency charged with the, the, the HIV response in Cambodia. What we, did, what we didn't realize was that the, the director of NCHADS uh, had been, a, well, we sort of realized it but when he got there, but the director of NCHADS had done his master's at the University of New South Wales, very, Dr. Min Chi Vuen, very quiet, unassuming, had been sitting in our, in, in our epidemiology classes in the 90s. Uh, when we went over there and, and started uh, doing the work there, we realized that he was a very senior and powerful figure indeed, whose, whose uh, influence and relationship with us was, uh, was, was very important in, in making sure that we could establish the collaborations there. Uh, eventually, after several years, we, we had funding from AusAid, which was the pre which was the Australian Aid Agency established um, for a number of years, which was then absorbed into, into the Department of Foreign Affairs of Trade. We had some, and they funded a, a project which was uh, initially, which was focused on, on uh, collecting data and monitoring the, the uptake of antiretroviral therapy, which was a, uh, at that point, a very new thing for Cambodia. Uh, as I mentioned before, it was the revolution in HIV treatment and, and making it accessible around the world through Global Fund and other sources uh, had really just started at that point. Um, we also, uh, David negotiated a, 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 a donation from a, farm, a big pharma company that enabled us to set up a clinic, the social health clinic, which is actually still running in, in, in Cambodia. Uh, we then had also Gates Foundation funding for um, a trial, which I'll come back to in a second. Um, and then uh, very recently, th this relationship has been reignited. And I was uh, on a call again last night with some of the, the leaders from Cambodia with the, uh, a project that uh, uh, Lisa Doyle has led to establish laboratory strengthening with, with uh, Cambodia. And, and that's a, a, with a whole new uh, pathway for our collaborations there. Um, again, like, as with, as with uh, HIP, HIVNAT, we had Kirby Institute staff based in country for a number of years. At one point, we actually had four staff in Cambodia, all attached to NCHADS. Um, and we had a major role in guiding projects. I've already mentioned these first two, the national treatment reporting and the establishment of the clinical service. We also had the um, quite uh, tough going with what, was, what became known as the failed PrEP trial. This would have been the first trial in the world of uh, HIV pre-exposure prophylaxis. Uh, but for a number of reasons, it was... Um, when it was just on the verge of starting to recruit, it was um, closed down by the government. Um, the, the, um, as I mentioned also, the laboratory development is, is a new initiative that builds on, on work that again, again, Philip Cunningham had started off in Cambodia in the early 2000s, and uh, it's, it's quite exciting that we'll be returning to that very soon. Uh, moving to Papua New Guinea, our nearest neighbor and very close uh, collaborator, uh, again, our initial engagement was on surveillance work in the, in the early 2000s. Uh, the, the link to the Papua New Guinea Institute of Medical Research, which we worked with very closely uh, over the, the last 15 years, began really in 2006 when uh, Heather Worth from, used to be with the School of Population Health uh, with, through funding from AusAid, which uh, as I mentioned, no longer exists, um, set up a program which uh, Angela Kelly then ended up uh, directing and moved, moved to, to uh, Papua New Guinea in, the IMR in 2007, with the focus of training, uh, training staff, training Papua New Guinea cadets in social science methodologies in health and HIV particularly. Um, sub subsequently, um, then Andrew Vallely and Lisa Vallely moved there uh, in about 2010. And 
it's it's subsequently um, a, a large range of very major programmatic funding has been received for a wide range of projects, all, all collaborating with the Papua New Guinea Institute of Medical Research or through the Papua New Guinea Institute of Medical Research. Um, Andrew and and um, and uh, Angela and Lisa, and then more recently, uh, Michaela have, have been based in country for varying time periods uh, and have basically embedded them, their, themselves as staff within the Papua New Guinea Institute of Medical Research. Um, so, so that's been the, the key sort of factor of having people working not just in country, but really within the organization that is the lead research uh, agency for in health for Papua New Guinea. Uh, our, our, our teams have had major roles in working with the IMR and guiding projects. Uh, as I mentioned, some of the work that Angela initiated in social science and participatory research, uh, major epidemiological surveys in areas such as HPV and and uh, and the, and, uh, and and HIV and STIs um, that uh, have been co-led by, by the Kirby Institute and, and the, with the IMR being the, the in-country agency, uh, and then intervention trials, the, the very big, the, I think the biggest trial uh, of its kind in Papua New Guinea, the, the, the one-time trial, which uh, investigating the use of point of care diagnostics for uh, reducing, for in, in pregnant women for improving birth outcomes. And then again, this very new initiative uh, that, uh, that we, we've re recently had funding from DFAT to, to support lab strengthening. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, and another very new initiative uh, and, and something very new for uh, for us is a major donation from the Min Mindaroo Foundation, uh, again led by by Andrew, but collaborating with a number of other agencies to to uh, improve um, cervical cancer outcomes in Papua New Guinea and also in, in Vanuatu. Um, and then now moving to to, to Indonesia. Um, Again, this, the surveillance was the way in, and the World Bank supported a number of activities that were of a short-term nature uh, on, in, in the surveillance area. Um, I think the first major study that the Kirby Institute was, was, had a leadership role in was HATI, which um, um, where uh, there was funding from DFAT and from the, the World Health Organization, a number of us within the Kirby Institute, David, of course, Matthew, Law, um, and a number of other staff became involved in, in HATI, which aimed to really address the issue of very poor uptake of testing and treatment for HIV in, in Indonesia. Um, and this study proved to be, I think, a, a major a collaborative um, vehicle, which has led to a number of different, number of, uh, I think, important health outcomes and collaborations with key universities and the Ministry of Health in, and, and community-based organizations in country. Um, and then there's a whole new strand to our collaborations in Indonesia, which have really been led by um, Virginia Wiseman, which uh, under the general banner of, of health economics and health systems, and this has really been an explosion of collaboration, uh, both with the Ministry of Health, a number of different um, agencies, and Virginia is one of our discussants here and, and may want to comment on some of the, this work, but uh, I think this has, has really, sh this work, which is first of all, looking at the uptake of universal health coverage in uh, and equity in Indonesia, uh, the, the Pintar study looking at uh, improving the, the practices of, of, of pharmacies in prescribing, um, Menjaga studies looking at improving antenatal uh, screening for uh, syphilis, HIV, and then the Domino study looking at the impact of COVID. Uh, these are really major funding initiatives that uh, we're, we're through funding from, from DFAT in Australia, but also through Virginia's connections in the UK, through her uh, other appointment through London School, has enabled us to access quite major funding from, from the UK. Um, these have been important partnerships with the Ministry of Health. So far, we haven't had staff based in Indonesia, but Indonesia is a large and complex country that I think that we can, um, we can uh, you know, rely on those, those important partnerships to build. I'm just gonna talk about two other topics before I, I as case studies. Um, a really crucial area for the Kirby Institute has been this, our leadership in international trials. Um, I think the, the key turning point, we, we've been involved as, as sites or as Australian coordinator in many, many international trials, but I think the transition into leadership began with the funding of the Insight Network, where we became the International Coordinating Centre uh, in 2006, funded by the United States National Institutes of Health. Um, and the, this was a, a, a trial network that included 
many rich countries, but also included uh, Thailand, Indone India, Malaysia, La Latin American countries, and Nigeria as sites that were um, funded through un under the Kirby Institute's coordination. So, so we began to, uh, as, as well as having a leadership role in the network itself, we undertook these roles uh, of supporting uh, the development and the emergence of expertise in the clinical trials capacity for HIV uh, capacity to do so in all these different countries. Um, the, I, the, I think it's fair to say that the, the, of, of the key HIV trials of the, of the um, 21st century, SMART and START really stand out. The SMART trial was the one that said, uh, if you start treatment, don't stop. It's not a good thing to stop treatment once you've started if you have HIV. And the START trial was the trial that said, as soon as you're diagnosed with HIV, no matter how good your immune system looks, start treatment because it's going to be a better outcome for you. And these, these are the key trials that really defined the HIV treatment agenda for, um, that, that we have today. Um, then following those successes, there were some, a number of Kirby Institute-led trials that used the same network, Encore, Altair, uh, stand out as key ones. Um, and then the, the, the DEFT trial, which was funded um, by Unitaid, expanded into further lower income sites and there was some uh, by, by linking up with some uh, using our relationships with partners in in uh, some of these countries we we really moved to uh, countries such as Mali and, and and Guinea which are and and then also in Indonesia which were countries that really hadn't had any experience at all of these sorts of trials uh, and that same on the same basis with with NIH funding there's been an expansion into COVID trials um, so this has really been a, an evolution both in terms of the types of trial and the types of sites. And then my final case study is a, an area that's relatively new for Kirby Institute of Neglect Tropical Diseases, where uh, it's a, we, we've started working on scabies through, through uh, collaborations with the Murdoch Children's Research Institute and, and Lucia Romani was our person in the field for some very important trials on, on scabies. Um, and then, uh, Susanna Vasneri joined us in 2018 and really upped the ante in, in uh, neglected tropical diseases, introducing collaborations in, uh, on soil transmitted helminths, which is basically in, intestinal worms in, in uh, Timor Leste, in Solomon Islands, Vietnam, and Angola. Um, and uh, through Susanna's leadership, we've also uh, continued to work on trachoma, which we were initially, initially doing in Australia, but now expanded our work into Nauru, Solomon Islands, and Malawi. And Susanna is also working on schistosomiasis control in uh, and uh, surveillance in Angola, um, and and uh, we're about to start on on working on yours in Solomon Islands and Vanuatu. So we really have a quite a comprehensive program of in many countries of these neglected tropical diseases, and that's been enhanced by funding uh, by the award of the first NHMRC uh, Centre for Research Excellence in neglected tropical diseases a couple of years ago, which brings together partners from around Australia. Uh, and then very importantly, a, a partnership grant in, in this area, which Susanna's led, which I believe is the first NHM, NRC, NHMRC partnership to actually be awarded for work in low and middle income countries. So it's a real breakthrough, not just for us, but for the whole NHMRC partnership scheme. Um, I'm, I'm gonna skip over this one, this summarizes um, everything I've just said, but the most important thing to see is that uh, in black is all the HIV work that led in many countries, but we, you can see that the red is the different initiatives that are not HIV. So we're, you know, we've transitioned from our focus on HIV into work in many other areas. So what are the success factors? Well, I'd like, I'm sure the discussants will have much to say. I think we've been able to identify opportunities and get our timing, funding and the issues right. We've had national high level collaborators and champions for our work, and I've mentioned several of them on the way through. We've had country based team members, I'm not sure if that's been crucial. We've supported early and mid career investigators in country. Uh, we've been adaptable to changing needs. We've done capacity building, which involves mentoring relationships, short courses, but also field training courses, such as the, uh, the chart program that we've had to suspend because of COVID. And I think really gratifyingly, we've had doctoral students, most recently we've now, we, we now have, I think, four or five doctoral students from uh, each of Indonesia and, and Papua New Guinea and, and uh, really building those relationships for the long term. We also need to think how we build our own capacity. We, we not just about, it. capacity building is, not, is a, is a two-way street. There have been, of course, tensions in our global health efforts. 
Um, do we lead projects or do we support LMA's country leadership? Or we obviously have to have to do both. Um, how do we work with community-based organisations? Should we do it through country-based ones or should we do it through our partners such as, as, such as um, uh, AFEO in Australia and, and make sure we're working through Australian-based CBOs? Um, do we concentrate on our academic outputs or country outcomes? Obviously, we have to do both. For our doctoral students, do we make, do we make sure that their topics are of national interest or the ones that are going to uh, work best in the Australian setting? A really key point, how do we work with other institutes? Are we collaborators? Are we competitors? Sometimes we're both, and there's, there's obviously a tension there. Um, there's the Australian way of doing business with versus the way we do business in country. And, and I think this is really important in looking at how the university sees our work in global health, because sometimes they really have to um, bend over backwards and, and, and make sure that our, our systems um, are adaptable to the needs of working in other countries. Um, there's the whole decolonizing agenda, which I, I think should be a subject of a whole different seminar of the relationship, what the, and I've alluded to at the start about uh, how do we make sure that our, our global health work is responsive to uh, ownership and the needs of the countries with whom we, we work. And it is, it is a changing world, COVID-19, I don't need to say anything about that. And I've also mentioned, I've already mentioned re revisiting the global health agenda. Pharma, pharma funding, which started off a lot of our programs, is now harder to access. The big trials in HIV are largely finished. Australian overseas development assistance is highly targeted to health security. Uh, there are new funding opportunities via the NHMRC, other sources, but on the other hand, the research career environment is getting tougher and tougher. Um, so I'll uh, leave it there. It's, I talked for a little bit longer than I wanted. I'll hand over to Tony to, uh, to steer the discussion and discussions. Thanks very much. Thanks, John. Um... We've had a couple of technical issues and my video was slow to come on there. Thanks for that uh, rapid summary of a great deal of work and partnership. So we'll move uh, rapidly to the panelist discussion and we're very lucky to have uh, a great panel of people that include uh, Andrew Vallali, who's uh, head of the Public Health Interventions uh, Research Program and has done a lot of work in uh, PNG. Gail Matthews is head of the Therapeutic Vaccine Research Program here at the Kirby. Uh, Virginia Wiseman, who's uh, head of uh, and chair of the Health Economics and Health Systems Advisory Committee. And uh, certainly last but not least, uh, Professor Willie Pomat, who is uh, the director of the uh, PNG IMR. And I might start with uh, Willie and ask him to reflect on some of those things that John highlighted as uh, the keys to success. And as uh, you know, the director of the IMR and with great experience, uh, if you could reflect on what you think the essential components of, of these sort of, uh, of driving this sort of global health agenda in country uh, is. Thank you, Tony, and thank you for having me. Uh, thank you to all the panelists as well. And um, hopefully we can, you know, meet sometime soon with COVID and everything. So we'll, we'll meet in person as opposed to through a computer screen. But it's great, uh, John, thank you very much. I was able to connect um, and listen to some of uh, what we were talking about, uh, saying yes. earlier. And indeed we've, we've got a great partnership that's going on. And um, probably something that John didn't um, mention is the buttressing coalition which for a PNG IMI is something that we ask our partners to um, help us to build our infrastructure capacity. And this has, is being managed through the Kirby Institute and, and has been very helpful for us at the Institute as well. But the, um, like John said, this, this research that we collaborate with the Kirby and the University of New South Wales, both uh, in a number of infectious disease um, including uh, what he mentioned, HIV, TB, um, and more recently, <clears throat> um, neglected trop tropical disease, which we've had partnership with others, but uh, with Susanna um, currently getting the grant, we'll hopefully be able to nest some of the research into ongoing um, activities that we have. So it's been a great partnership for us, between us and the KB Institute. And um, I guess my own... Um, 
I, I also have a, an appointment with, with through the Cape Institute to, to the University of New South Wales and Cape Institute. And um, so it's been, it's been great for us in, the, in that sense, in that um, um, we have all this research that we work together. You have the expertise, we have some of the expertise and together we are working together to ensure that we improve um, health of essentially Papua New Guineans, but I know you, you cut across a few other countries. And so health of the people of the world uh, in areas um, that we, are, um, we have some expertise in. So it's, it's great in that way. Um, capacity building, we've got quite a few students. A couple of them are still completing their PhDs at the moment. And I hope that they can, they've added to um, our, they're adding to our uh, research capacity, but also as students, international students, that they were able to add to the culture at KB as well as uh, at the University of New South Wales. Um, and obviously we're in the COVID situation and, and obviously um, uh, we are also um, trying to partner with uh, Rowena and her team on the uh, genetic sequencing side of things as well. So there's a lot of um, research activities as well as um, implementation, if you like, of different um, activities that to help the health situation in Papua New Guinea. So I guess, you know, the research focus seems to be going well. Uh, probably, and Andrew and I, I have talked about this quite a, on a few occasions. How do we then translate some of these research into policy, given that the government of Papua New Guinea and probably for a lot of um, um, low and middle income countries might not have the capacity to be able to implement. And so, how, uh, you know, identifying that transition from, from research into um, translation of the findings that we've had is probably an area that it might not be our um, in the scope of work that we can do, nor can you, but may maybe identifying NGOs or somebody within the, within the country that can help us implement some of the good results that we are finding out and helping to implement those to help the Department of Health and the different departments to be to implement the translation of those research outcomes. And so that it's it's not only a policy paper that's sitting in the um, on the shelf of a, of the Department of Health or being you know gathering dust somewhere. It's actually translating it into something tangible, tangible that we see in research, but we also see in um, um, in actual um, the implementation of the that. So I think with that, uh, thank you very much. I'll leave it there. I know time is running on on us. Thanks, Willie, and I couldn't agree more with uh, those last sentiments. And so, and that might be a good segue to Virginia to sort of see if see what she has to say in in her field uh, about uh, implementation type research around health economics and uh, health systems research uh, in uh, uh, in a global health perspective. Virginia, thanks, Tony. Um, yeah, well said, Willie. Um, completely agree. I think um, in terms of our work, particularly in Indonesia, um, working with people who are really um, at this sort of coal face of policy, but also uh, in the research sphere is, has made a lot of difference. So I know we've got joining this call today, Professor Ari Provenzari from University Gajamada. She and I are co-PIs on most of the projects that John listed in one of his slides. And, you know, people like Ari who are on National Task Force, so for our projects that are on AMR, the Pintar project, you know, she's directly involved in those task force. So it's, it's, it's um, a really important kind of connection to have. For our financing work, we have, um, we've been really fortunate to work with people like uh, Professor Hasbullah Thrabani, who's at the University of Indonesia and USAID. And he, I mean, it, in Indonesia, is very well known as someone who is um, developing legislation around universal health care coverage and the National Health Insurance Scheme. So it's a real privilege to, to work with all of them. And I think that's um, really how we've been able to um, maximise the impact of the research. Um, yeah, and so our, our research going forward, just to maybe quickly add, 
is really about trying to um, look at health system bottlenecks that might be um, standing in the way of scaling up a lot of the new technologies, for example, around infectious diseases um, and expanding access to those. Um, and also looking at the quality of care. We do a lot of work around measuring quality of care um, so that um, it's not just about extending coverage, but actually making sure that what people end up accessing is, is of, of uh, good quality. And the last thing is financing. A lot of countries um, in the region are actually facing budgets that are reducing quite dramatically, even pre-COVID. And overseas development assistance is also going down. So there's got to be um, a lot more work, a lot more research around trying to think about how we expand fiscal space for, for health um, and also minimise wastage in health systems. So that's kind of where our, our direction is going. Thanks, Virginia. So Gail, with your uh, sort of clinical research hat on, what do you think are the, the critical components of, of success in, in this area? Yeah, so look, I'm, I'm going to speak very much from one aspect of research I and mean, research as a whole broad spectrum. Um, I'm, I'm going to speak really from very much the sort of clinical trial aspect and, and sort of therapeutic development. And I think one thing that has been really clear to me sort of moving into sort of TBRP and, and sort of um, uh, taking over the, 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 the leadership of those, those COVID-19 studies, as well as the HIV studies and, and particularly COVID-19, um, it, you know, working with the NIH, it's very clear from everything I hear and everybody I hear how important that true global representation in clinical trial development of new drugs is really, really very important um, um, because otherwise it can be you are very US centric, uh, centric very dominated by the, the, the global north, whatever John called it, um, and, and global representation in clinical trials of drug developments for um pandemics such as COVID is, is critically important, but there are incredible challenges uh, to doing that um, because of the complexities sometimes of, of carrying out clinical trial research um, in regulatory environments uh, uh, in, in low middle income countries. I think Kirby has had incredible success in this area before. Um, I think Kirby is, uh, you know, I keep hearing Kirby's a brand, you know, everybody knows Kirby. And I think Kirby has a huge um, potential in terms of going forward to help um, uh, build uh, and guide capacity building in these type of clinical trials within the, the country. So what we're seeing, and, and maybe COVID-19 has shed a light a, a bit of this, is that countries are approaching us, they don't want to be sites, they want to set up their own clinical trial networks within their own countries, they want to um, learn how to, you know, how to build capacity to do those clinical trials, um, but they um, are looking to Kirby for some guidance um, for that, and I think it's an area that Kirby has particular um, history in uh, and uh, really can be um, real leaders um, in helping develop this um, and, and, and helping countries move forward because we will have another pandemic undoubtedly and those countries should be um, ready and willing to be able to do and participate in clinical trials just as the, the, the richer countries of the north. That was my quick Thank, Thanks, Gail. And that, uh, you know, I think the, the empowerment of uh, local investigators is absolutely, uh, I think it continues on the sort of theme that Willie brought up about you know being able to translate this, if we do have local buy-in and understanding, then the chance of implementation uh, into policy and outcomes is so much higher. So there is a chance to ask questions from the audience. I encourage you to put any questions into the Q and A box. But uh, having you know that that's a good segue now to to Andrew who who is uh, I think about in uh, you know working very closely with community and empowering community. So Andrew, would you like to extend uh, the sort of observations that, that Gail and others have made? Yeah, thanks Tony and thanks John for organizing this session and, and uh, particularly thank Willie for joining and, um, and for some of the comments that um, both Willie and Virginia and Gail have just um, you know, raised. I, but for me personally, in 25 years in working pretty much exclusively in low income settings, I mean, my work has always really been very much influenced by Paul Farmer, Robert Chambers, and in particular, 
the really landmark uh, work in the mid 80s of putting the last first and putting the first last and the the um the drive to change paradigms around how we do things in international development and particularly how we do things in rural development and address the needs of the poor and put those who are poor and in disadvantaged communities, put them first, use participatory methodologies to allow this to happen and really turn things on their head in terms of outsider driven learning and knowledge generation and research. And we, in my own career, I'd like to think that I've strived to try and do that. My, I was somewhat uh, disheartened um, to see the, which I think is actually a very, very powerful discourse in the Lancet Global Health this year um, around what is wrong with global health. And a number of letters and commentaries from some very eminent academics in low middle income settings, such as Elizabeth Bakuzi in Kenya and many others who I admire greatly, calling out systemic racism in global health, the need to break down the old colonial order, the need to look at how research funding actually works, the need to decolonize global health, to credit and acknowledge those that lead or should be leading, and to ask really why and for whom are we decolonizing global health and could we do more? So to me, I think as we move forward in global health, for me personally, and this is no reflection on other people's earlier work, but for me personally, I want to continue to strive as far as I can, as much as possible in my work, to support putting our colleagues first in low and middle income settings, to ensure that funding applications and papers are, we are supporting, I am supporting it and not always being the lead, that papers and grants and protocols, likewise, that we seek to collaborate and advocate and work together in partnerships and move towards what one, one uh, commentator has called a new culture of humble and constructive collaboration in global health to go forward. Um, and as Chambers said earlier, to hand over the lead, sit down, listen, let others take the lead, strive, I think, towards ultimately redundancy. As um, when I was a volunteer, when Lisa and I were first volunteers in the mid nineties in PNG in clinical practice in PNG, one of VSO, one of the voluntary services overseas, great um, kind of advice to, to all their volunteers was, you need to strive towards handing things over. You do strive towards making yourself redundant. Then you've done a fantastic job. And I think in, in global health, as we move forward, surely this is what we should be striving towards in the global north. We shouldn't be striving towards establishing larger and larger consolidations and centralizations of power. We should be we should be striving for the exact opposite, a decentralization, a support to address equity and to ensure that we allow those who have not been able, due to the structural um, problems inherent in global health, have not been allowed to lead and been able to lead fully to allow them to take that lead. Thanks, Andrew, for that uh, impassioned uh, 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 dissertation i think it's you know i think it summarizes uh what what should be uh many of our drivers and you know without blowing our own trumpet too much i think a lot of that is an underpinning philosophy and and i do think you know john raised it as his first case study i think hivnat is an extraordinary uh case study and a tribute to prapan and to europe and to david uh, that you know that that is a uh, you know a spun out fully independent uh, research institution that other people in the region now go to for direction and support. Uh, you know they're not just running their own show; they're helping other people run their shows. So, John, I might give you the honor of of any closing remarks. Thanks, Tony, and um, thanks again to. Um, all discussants and uh, ex excellent points for uh, in-depth and further contemplation. Um, I, I didn't mention in my talk, but I actually had done little sort of mini interviews with a number of people in the Kirby Institute um, just to ask them for the, their thoughts before I did that presentation. And I want to—I won't name them, but I, 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 they know who they are, and I, I thank them for their insights. Um, but what it also led me to to realise was that. Uh, every one of those stories has several seminars embedded in it and 
and, I, and I'd like to very much have this um, this become a sort of a series, a global health ser series of seminars that we we bring up the, the, the we we think through our history and and reflect on it, and, and just as Andrew said, try to figure out um, you know what are our guiding principles and and where we where we should be taking it, uh, and and there are, there are many people in the Kerb Institute here who um, who have been here a reasonably short amount of time, and I think would would really benefit from our, the understanding of where we might where we've come from and, and what our uh, directions are. But also those, those newer people, those younger people have so much to add. And as I, as I mentioned at the start, we have so much real, uh, the more I talk to people around the Kirby Institute, I find that people have worked in amazing places or they come from different countries and we really need to engage them in shaping this agenda uh, as, as, it, as we take it forward. So um, I, I've, um, I was, I was a bit terrified as doing this presentation, but I have learned so much from, from trying to pull it together and, and I, but I really see it as, as, as a starting point. And uh, it's, it's great to hear that uh, I hope Ari could join us and other people from other countries. And we would want, want to very much have them as our speakers and contributors to subsequent uh, discussions of this kind as, as we try and move this forward. So thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, everybody, for joining, and thanks, uh, John, for a great presentation. Thanks, Willie, for uh, battling the uh, the technical issues and, and managing to join us and taking time out of your busy schedule uh, to, to, to share your thoughts with us. And thanks, Gail, Virginia, and Andrew for their comments. Thanks very much. We'll close it there. <laughs>